Hello, good morning, everybody. I'm very sorry I don't speak Slovak or Czech, so it's a, that's the first exercise now to do it in English. Uh, my name is Thomas, Thomas Weible. Um, I'm the CTO of Flex Optics, a company which is specialized in optical transceivers. And as Andre said, we prepared something for today. We handed out some handouts, but there is no exam, so no worries, although we are here in a university environment. I just have to grab my presenter now. Um, so, when I started uh, Flex Optics 15 years ago, uh, together with my co-founder, it was always an interesting thing about transceivers when it comes to compatibility. But it, when I want to show that slide, it's, it's more the other perspective. So, Arista did a really great presentation uh, last year uh, about 400 gig set R transceivers, and that's mainly the talk today about, about coherent pluggables, how to do long distance transmission with DWDM with 400 gig and beyond. And there is a new technology called Coherent, which is now able in pluggable modules to be, uh, to be uh, established. So um, the interesting part, what I found out was, as I said, when I, 15 years ago, the company founded, it was always this battle about transceivers when you plug them into a switch and they were not supported at all. Uh, and then you had to do some tricks to get the transceiver up and running. So they were unsupported transceivers. Now, 15 years later, um, as we are talking about 400 gig and high power consumption transceivers, we are now talking about unsupported platforms. So it, it actually, it's a game changer. So it changed the game around, so this, the platforms are not supported any longer. But this, this was quite interesting to see. But uh, I don't want to talk more on that now. So I will hand over first to Gerhard. He will do some theory about uh, coherent pluggable technology, especially about the coherent part. And uh, then I'm later on, uh, show you how we integrate this in a switch operating system and especially for you as a technician, how you can identify pitfalls, issues, errors on your link, on your coherent link when you operate it. Gerhard, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, you can hear me. All right. Good. Um, my name is Gerhard Stein, Head of Product Development at Flex Optics some years working on amazing products such as Flexbox, and I'm going to talk about a little bit of the theory behind transceivers, especially the coherent one. And let's go back a couple of steps to the classical one, which uh, we also call direct detection transceiver, and their limits. So usually what you have here is um, a binary signal you are transferring, but Really, when you measure it, it looks more like this, a sinus wave, basically. And um, the problem is when you increase the frequency, which usually you want to do if you want to increase bandwidth, um, yeah, you end up doing something like this, that you increase the frequency. But the problem is when you want to measure it for recovering the signal on the other side, like a photo detector does, um, the problem is that you have effects like these, where it becomes much more difficult to detect what a one and what a zero is, basically. So what you have to do is change the threshold. It becomes... Um, a distance that is much shorter you have to measure and the tolerances and the error increases and that is the reason if you consider other effects like chromatic dispersion that um, cables normally are shorter if you want to have higher bandwidth. So what does uh, change with a coherent transceiver? First of all, um, the direct detection transceiver does not look at all the properties the light emits. One of the major properties, which is quite interesting, um, is polarization, which means, for example, who does have a screen protector on the notebook? Does somebody have something like that? All right, then you know for sure, this one also has a protective screen. When I tilt it, you stop seeing the picture. That is because um, light, natural light, is uh, not polarized, but you can polarize it through special kind of foils. And <clears throat> that is the effect we can <clears throat> benefit from. 
because light is not just all about amplitude, it's also about polarization. That is one thing. So we could transfer um, through polarization multiple signals at the same time um, with uh, laser it's other way around. So you have polarized light and you combine it with another polarized light. And since you have the cross section of your cable, like this one, we are looking uh, aside on it, um, you have the Y plane and there's also an X plane. C plane being the um, time or wherever the cable is going to your reception side, right? So um, when we look at this signal, what we end up seeing here is the Y plane and we also have an X plane. And if you like, look carefully at this um, line, it looks a little bit like a geometrical form. Well, it turns out that coherent, coherent transceivers are able to transfer three-dimensional signal. And yeah, it looks like this. Now imagine you need um, an apparatus, a device that is able to recover a signal that looks like this. It looks weird, doesn't it? Does it look like a sinus wave? Not at all, right? Um, the thing is, we have not talked about the third property, but I mentioned it in the slides, phase. So phase is one thing, polarization is another thing. Now, polarization is um, something we can look up uh, on, but let's uh, concentrate on one slide and let me explain how um, phase shifting works. So, next slide. Here we go. So what we are doing basically is combining amplitude and phase by um, using a constellation diagram. Now we are looking at the X plane. So just taking one plane, there's a Y plane. As said, they are being transferred at the same time. And what we are doing here basically is splitting up our components in, uh, maybe you have seen it in electrical engineering that um, we talk about a complex number, imaginary part and real part. So it's the same here, the in-phase component, I'm in phase, degree is zero, um, means real part and imaginary part is this axis. It's really the same, it's just a different naming you use for signal theory. And what we are doing is uh, scattering the signal. Now, um, we want to play a little game, so can you please raise a hand whoever has a card? I would like to count you guys, I'm counting one. Who else? Two? Just ah, okay. wave them. Just, so just wave see. them. Yeah, just, just wave them. You can All do this right. early on. Okay. I think Let we prepared know. 16 cards. I'm seeing 16 cards. So all good. Uh, we are going to play a little game and we are going to guess what kind of signal we are transferring. We are still talking about binary signals. These are uh, 01, 01. All, all these are binary signals. So. Let's start um, for a little help, because I will get to the next problem you have to face with transceivers, which is a bit error rate. And through this game, I hope um, you have a better understanding of it. At least I will try my best to explain it. So um, it's the same plane. We have our 16 quantum constellation diagram. And on your cards, you have phase and you have amplitude. And what we are going to do now is um, to verify if the signal I, as a transceiver, I'm sending to you guys, you are receiving it correctly. So what I'm going to tra transfer is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, let me display it here. 1, 1, 1, 1. And I'm asking you to raise a card, whoever thinks that has the signal of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And I'm the center, the center of the diagram. So we've ah, yeah. got 16 here's, cards, 16 constellation points distributed now. And I'm the center. So here is zero degrees, here's 90 degrees. So what we have here is basically 45. Who has 45? Here we uh -huh. go. Here we go. Perfect. An That's amplitude of 33? Yes. He has it? Ah, perfect. All right. Then 0101 is the next signal I am transferring. It will be a nice uh, laugh message. <laughs> um, where do we have this guy? It is about uh, 0101 here. So what do we have here as angle? Um, this is a negative plane of angles. So what we have here is more than 90 degrees. Who has it? So still 33% of amplitude. 
and more than 90 degrees, so 135. Minus 135. You have it? Great. Good. So, uh, last signal, and with that we have completed our love message, is 100%, uh, no, it's not 100%, uh, let me check. On which plane is it? Uh, oh, oh, and one, one. Oh, oh, one, one is here. So, 75%, and what angle do we have here? It's not 135, it's more than 135. 168, ah, here we go. 75, 75, great. So, um, I saw your cards, they all were correct. If I would have to count a bit, all right, I would have said uh, all these people who lifted their hand, the card, with an incorrect number, I would have uh, put them here into the numerator, which is zero, and I would have divided into the total amount of transferred bit. We transferred 12 bits, and there were no errors. You are a great um, audience, thank you very much. So we have a bit error rate of zero, congratulations. Thank you. All right, but there are more ways to measure errors. So if you're coming from the uh, data science guy, computer science guy, you only care for bits. What we were doing basically right now in this game. But um, there's another way to measure the uh, quality of your cable and transceivers and so on, which is a signal to noise ratio. It's a logarithmic uh, value you can calculate, and basically when you're displayed on a diagram, here I'm sending a signal, and here what you have is noise, and what we want to avoid is the noise, obviously. So um, what we do here is increase the distance. So this is a, an example of a good signal-to-noise ratio. You still can measure it, you still can detect it, and all is good. So lower the signal-to-noise ratio, the more difficult it is to distinguish between the real signal and the noise you get. So you don't want to have that, right? Uh, ESNR and OSNR, where there's an electrical signal on the transceiver, on the uh, side where you have to convert to your binary signal. The optical part also exists, obviously. You can measure an electrical and optical signal, and yeah, um, that's basically it. Now for an example how um, this looks like when we have a good signal-to-noise ratio, so 30 dB is good. We are hitting the spots where we are uh, supposed to be hitting them, but the more we decrease this value, the more it gets scattered around. Here, you, I mean, you can still set up a window and see, okay, these are the bits I'm transferring, I'm all good with 20 still works, but going to five, ugh, it's more difficult to really recover your signal. All right, um, one last slide about error vector magnitude, which for coherent transceivers is interesting, is um, the error vector. The error vector is, uh, yeah, a little bit more complex. So what you do is look at your constellation diagram, imaginary part, real part, I talked about it basically, and um, here is our real point we want to hit, and here's our measured point. And the difference between this as a vector given is your error vector. Of course, with the magnitude, you can measure the distance, but you can also do more analysis like, yeah, is there an IQ phase error, which means maybe um, there's some rotational issue with the signal that the switch got rotated, stuff like that, and for some reason the cable reacts uh, pretty odd on that, but what we really want to achieve with that and to get it simple and summarized appropriately is an error vector magnitude uh, we hopefully will see on our routers and network devices, and obviously we want to reduce this value to zero. Thank you very much. And uh, we will get to the practical part with Thomas Weible and uh, how it looks on a typical Nokia switch with SROS installed on it. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Gerhard. So what we did, uh, we took a coherent pluggable 400 gigabit uh, together with DKIX in Germany and uh, operated uh, a link, a 400 gig link in their Nokia gear. And we basically took the CLI, did a show port, and looked what the Nokia returns us. And uh, in the next couple of slides, I will divide these parts to explain you which parameters are important and which one uh, you should be familiar so far when you operate regular transceivers, like direct detection transceivers, like 10 gig or um, 
40 gig transceivers, and now with the coherent, we get way more parameters. So here you see a typical show port, um, quite straightforward. We get the parameters, which what this transceiver can do. Uh, it's a 400 gig interface, and uh, yeah, uh, the wavelength we are currently on, and the coherent one has the nice benefit they are tunable, so you can change the frequency of the of the, of the laser itself. And you can also change the grid in which, it, which is it, it's operating. Typically, DWDM operates on 100 gigahertz grids uh, of your multiplexes, but also when you have more dense um, uh, setups, you have 50 gigahertz. We also see the, 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 the frequency where we can D between uh, channel 13 and channel uh, 61, which is also in terahertz. 191.3 up to 196.1. So that's also how you do the channel calculation. Typically, you take the terahertz and then uh, take the yeah the, the first decimal uh, digit plus the uh, before the decimal point, and that's your channel number. So we have channel 13 to channel uh, 61. There's not much more to say. Uh, yeah typical parameters like when it's produced and so on. Um, for sure, uh, coherent transceiver do have diagnostic monitoring, uh, which you should be familiar uh, in these days now, so we can measure temperature, uh, uh, voltage, and also TX and RX levels. For coherent ones, the temperature, I highlighted it a little bit, is very important. That's also what I referred at the beginning about the unsupported platforms, because um, the temperature is a critical part. Uh, you, you shouldn't overheat your transceiver, and um, su such a module can take up to 17, 20 watts. And when you imagine you have a 32-port switch, uh, each port is taking 17 watts. This, you do the math, you will be up, you're going to be beyond 500 watts just on the transceiver side. And in the optical communication, all the watts or the power we feed into a transceiver is mainly the result of heat later on. So we have to get rid of that heat, um, and that, that's a critical part. So you, you need to monitor the temperature, and for sure the values go up to plus 50, plus 60 degrees centigrade, and that's normal opera uh, operating conditions. So don't be upset if, if your temperatures go up. If you're beyond 70 degrees, then it's going to be an issue, according to the specs of, of the transceivers, for sure, or the thresholds. Now, for the, um, for the coherent side, uh, Nokia or the Nokia OS, they added a whole section just for the coherent optical module. And these are the interesting parts, especially when you want to troubleshoot a link now uh, to see if it's working properly or not before you see bit errors or even flapping links or frame errors, etc because they are all above on the layers. So this is really physical uh, layer one. Uh, where we can do measurements. So we start, uh, first of all, with the RX channel. That's an interesting thing here. When you operate today a DWDM network with 10 gigabit, for example, you typically look on the TX channel that this is fitting to your MUX, and the RX, you, you don't have to be aware that much because the receiver side is typically broadband. It takes everything, and MUX beyond, uh, before your transceiver is filtering. Now, on the transceiver, for the coherent one, we have to uh, take in consideration that the receiver needs to distinguish the signal, and we have to tune as well the receiver to say, okay, you have to lock your oscillator, there's an oscillator inside, to channel 23, because that's the receiving signal. So that's the first step you need to, to be aware. You need to check um, on which channel is the counterpart interface transmitting, and you have to lock your receiver to that channel as well. Typically, it's the same channel number which, when, when you are transmitting, for because we are also on channel 23 now, and uh, we are on the transmitting side and on the receiving as well. Um, the second one is uh, dispersion. Um, I just have to get over there. It's a little bit with the loudspeakers. Um, the dispersion is well known from the CWDM networks. Uh, when you operate 10 gigabit CWDM networks uh, from 1310 up to 1610 nanometers, you might be aware that 
the higher um, the, the wavelength, the more you have to take in consideration about chromatic dispersion. So what is chromatic dispersion? It will change your signal in velocity while it's traversing on your, on your fiber. So when you put the signal at the beginning on the fiber, it will change over the time when it's hitting the receiver. And this can make serious issues because, yes, the receiver can't detect it any longer. The coherent modules, they have the great capability to have a broad set of um, how they are tolerant to chromatic dispersion. Here you see the, the sweeping in the end. So we start from 2,000 picoseconds per nanometer down to minus 25,000. And that's, that's a bit, uh, pretty big, uh, broad range. And um, it can compensate it automatically, and that's pretty cool. So we see here the actually, the actually measured uh, dispersion, which is 220 picoseconds per nanometer. And if you know the link length of your span, or the other way around, if you know the characteristic of your fiber, which has, for example, 10 picoseconds per nanometer per kilometer, you can do the math. Uh, how long is your link? And in this uh, situation, you would do, we had a, a fiber with 10 picoseconds per nanometer, per kilometer, so this would end up in 22 kilometer fiber. But um, actually, there is an offset of 80 picoseconds in the Nokia OS. We couldn't figure it out, so the fiber was actually 15 kilometers. The characteristics were correct with 10 picoseconds per nanometer per kilometer, and we s somehow figured out an offset of 80 picoseconds per nanometer. How did we figure that out? We built a back-to-back -back link with just two meters of jumper cable, and there it showed up 80 picoseconds per nanometer. So actually, there should be zero picoseconds per nanometer this dispersion because it's very short. Um, again, uh, dispersion. So the change of the signal over time is now, as uh, Gerhard mentioned, about the polarization. We have two axes, the x and y axis, and also in the inner fiber itself, the the signal when we have the x, uh, x and the y plane or plane here, yeah, they can change while they're traversing o over time. And this delay is called a, a diff different group delay. And here we measure two picoseconds. And typically, the transceivers are capable to compensate up to 10 picoseconds. Afterwards, they will end up in bit errors. But this is in the data sheet uh, of, of the transceiver typically mentioned that you know how how much they can compensate here. So that's about dispersion. And now we're coming to another thing, um, which is a special thing about the, 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 the QAM modulation. Uh, at the beginning in November, when, I, or when we both made this presentation, there were those migrant birds traveling towards the south. This was just around our headboard. I really like that picture. And how do they find their way they do have a pilot at the beginning. Okay, they have a couple of pilots now, but here is a single pilot who is leading towards the south. The same we have in our coherent transmission. So uh, there is a pilot sequence, and we take the outer edges with the 100% uh, amplitude to, to identify uh, if the, the, the phase is shifting. This can happen, for example, via a light strike the phase of the optical signal can shift. And with those four pilot signals, we are capable to, to shift it back, to identify, hey, there is an issue. We have to shift back the modulation to the right angle. Um, and in the Nokia gear, this is called a CPR window size to recover the phase. And, and the reason why we do, do it, have it here is it's, uh, it's set to 32 symbols. It's the size of the, uh, how many symbols we measure to see it's a sliding window to identify a phase shift or not. So when you make the window smaller, the f you, you can correct uh, phase shift quite quicker, but this br brings also um, some, uh, will add some bit errors on, on the link. So you, you have to, to make it on a decent size and that's the default setting is 32, which works pretty good. What else? On the optical, optical side, um, the OSNR is, is an important thing. Um, as Gerhard said, the, um, told the, about the um, theory, this link, our 15 kilometer link, was running with 32 dB OS, OSNR, which was very, very good. 
because typ a typical coherent pluggable is capable down to 26 dB, um, and we were way beyond that, so this was very fine. And then there is the RxQ margin. This was a little bit tricky because we couldn't figure out what it's meant in the optical world. In the optical world, we figured out later on, it's typically, typically called the Q factor. And what does it mean is, it's the margin how much space we have left until our FEC, because we have a forward error correction inside of the transceiver is capable to correct the signal. So if this value is going towards zero, the FEC is not capable any longer to correct errors, and then you will end up at the end with bit errors. And therefore, those numbers need to be taken into consideration. So the RxQ margin, or most probably in other systems, it's called the Q factor, in combination with the prefec errors. So that's the error rate before it hits um, the FEC. That's an important measurement where you need to look at. Uh, and on a back-to-back -back link, we had roughly 4 dB of margin left. and. Um, that's the maximum, actually, what we saw there. And um, just need to look at the time. There we are. Um, another thing what we identified is you really need to, to look at the, at the specs, um, what your transceiver can do. Why? Because the operating system allows you to set different compatibility modules. This coherent transceiver is not any longer just a plain 400 gig module because we have different application modes, as you can see here, 1 to 15, how you can configure it typically. So it's not only a pure, pure 400 gig module, you can even set it up as a 2 by 200 gig or even a 300 gig module or break it out to 4 by 100 gig or if it's needed, down to 100 gig only if, if you want to do this. And um, a well-known and mainly used in the community now is the Open ZR Plus application mode, and you can configure it, but when you really look at the specs of the transceiver itself, it can't handle the Open ZR Plus. It can only do the OIF 400 ZR, unamplified and amplified. And there is no check in the operating system. So um, why is this important? I can just go back. Uh, between those operating modes, there are different facts involved. So you got the C fact or an O fact. Uh, these are just different matters how you do corrections with the forward error corrections and different math and algorithms. And you have a way higher symbol rate. So um, it's not compatible with each other. But there are no checks in the operating system. So you really need to know what is. Um, your transceiver capable and then set the right mode that the host will provide the right uh, simple rate as well. To give you an overview, and I have to accelerate a bit, is when we look at the application bit rate, we are running a 400 gig ZR at roughly 480 gigabit. Now when you look at Ethernet, which is rated typically for 425 gigabit, a typical Ethernet link at LR, for example. So there is an overhead of roughly 50 gigabit, and this overhead is needed for the symbol, uh, for the pilot sequence, for as an overhead to do the correction of the shift, plus it needs, uh, it's needed by the forward error correction to correct errors. So we add additional um, speed uh, on, the, on, on the application bit rate that we have more bandwidth available. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I need to skip a little bit um, to be in time. Um, just a little bit of an outlook, look where we are going to. So the modulation scheme of coherent is one main technology how to increase bandwidth in the future. So this is the starting point with 400 gigabit. And when you have an outlook up to 800 gig, 1.6 1 tera or even a 3.2 terabit, the modulation, as you can see, you can from down here, this is PEM4 modulated signal, which is known or um, uh, from the 100 gigabit transmission. And when we do it by, uh, by with uh, PEM, um, not PEM4, with um, 16 QAM modulation, uh, we can uh, multiply it by eight the speed and go up to 1.6 tera if, if, if this is needed. 
Another way to increase bandwidth is to increase the speed on the electrical signaling from 50 gigabaud, and don't be confused with the gigabaud or the gigabit. So a 50 gigabaud PEM4 modulated signal actually does transmit 100 gigabit. And um, so that's the, the 50 gigabaud is actually the, like the, the high frequency part on the electrical side. And uh, so industry is aiming definitely to 100 gigabaud to, to build PCBs who are able to do 100 gigabaud. And now even thinking doing 200 gigabaud on the electrical lanes. So when you have four lanes and doing 200 gigabaud on those four lanes, you get end up with 800 uh, gigabaud then or in combination doing the 800 gigabit depending on the modulation. And just a small outlook and then we're done is um, a breakout mode. As I mentioned at the beginning of, of, of a coherent transceiver, you can configure it in different application modes. It's not a pure 400 gig transceiver. You can even slice it down to, let's say, like in this example, um, four, four by 100 gigabit links. But this is an optical breakout. This is not a physical uh, breakout. And the great thing is here, you, you give a, a subcarrier on your, this is our frequency here, um, to a certain yeah, receiver. So in this circumstance, we have four different receivers. Um, they are connected via a, a splitter, basically. That's an optical splitter. They all get the coherent signal. And the, the first one grabs just his section, uh, his frequency, and the second one, the second frequency, and so on. Uh, to, sp to make a breakout mode on the optical side. This is mainly driven currently by Infinera, called also also the OpenXR. Uh, they even do it way harder. They go up to 25 gigabit per channel per uh, digital uh, subscriber, subcarrier multiplexing, and uh, they can end up with 16 channels, basically. That, that's the idea of it. This brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, and we are happy to take questions about the coherent technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we don't have much time for yeah. questions, but is there any one question? Quick one. Oh, there is one here, yeah. yes. Hello, I would like to uh, ask, uh, how does it align with uh, the uh, DWD systems for long haul lines like uh, like submarine, submarine cables or uh, these things because I have seen the word uh, coherent in this context for quite a long time but I don't have any experience with those systems so is, does it mean that uh, the technologies that uh, were in use in those long hauls are now going to uh, ordinary people like us uh, running yes. uh, several yes. kilometers? Correct and in a small nice form factor so I assume the submarine systems you're mentioning they were big line cards, uh, big shelves, and now we are squeezing that into a transceiver in the size of this presenter stick. That's the main goal. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, thank you. And yeah, we will continue immediately. Uh, one applause for uh, guys, please. Thank you. And sorry for... Uh,